Um, good afternoon. I, I have to just rush into this. I'm sorry, you've hardly got to sit down because we have to stop uh, by 2.20 for the Parliament sitting. Can I welcome everyone to the ninth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing of this 2014? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're silent? No apologies have been received. Item two, independent custody visiting. This is the main item on our agenda session uh, where we hear how the new arrangements are working in practice. And I welcome to the meeting Andy Cowie, uh, Assistant Inspector, HM Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, Brian McFadgen, uh, who is National Coordinating, Coordination Manager for Independent Custody Visiting of the SPA, Stevie Diamond, Chair of Unison uh, uh, Police Staff Scotland, and Paul Laidlaw, Independent Custody Visitor from Inverness. And can I say, I appreciate that, I think it's um, Mr Cowie and Mr Diamond, you've been here before, but I don't know if you've given evidence before to a committee, Mr McFadgen or Mr Laidlaw. Well, it's simply when a question is asked, if you feel you want to respond, if it's not specifically directed at, just indicate to me and I'll call you and your light will come on. You don't need to press anything. OK? Now, as we go straight to questions uh, because of the shortage of time. So, members, uh, John, Graham okay. and Kevin and then Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, panel. It, it, it's a question for all of you generally, and uh, um, although it's not bang on subject, it is relevant, and that's the thematic inspection of police custody arrangements in Scotland, the, the HMI. And uh, I found that there are uh, four references in there to the well-being of foreign nationals, so that is access to interpreting facilities, there's mention of reading materials, um, and Police Scotland needs to work with partners to introduce robust and proportionate processes to ensure that foreign national offenders are managed, pro um, managed appropriately. How does that touch in each of your jobs? I mean, there must be challenges connected with that. Yeah, who wants to take that first? <coughs> it's your report. Mr Kai, do you want to address that first? I will. I will. Thank, thank you. you Karina. Mr Finney, thank you for your question. The, uh, the report, which was the most comprehensive study of, of custody in modern times in Scotland, certainly picked up the, the challenges of dealing with a population which becomes ever more diverse. So where that actually hits the road is in, in the issue of rights and booking in of the custody to make sure that the necessary information is gathered. And that assists risk assessment because the custody may have medical problems which they don't declare through language difficulties means the care plan by custody division wouldn't be addressing the actual risks there. So there's a very real challenge around that and we recognise that in the report and encourage Police Scotland to ensure that as they plan moving forward that they're fully cognisant of that. I'm certainly reassured from the Chief Superintendent in charge of custody division that she is fully aware of that and ensuring that's at the forefront of her mind. And, and, of course, that won't just be at booking in period. There'll be an ongoing issue if someone was, for instance, detained over the weekend, perhaps for Mr Diamond's staff. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, Police Scotland have already have a, a custody uh, care and welfare of prisoners standard operating procedure, which uh, staff would adhere to, and that takes into account any, any custodies of foreign nationals. The concern from Unison from that is that uh, the difficulty in the number of staff that we have at the moment, uh, uh, gaps in staffing, uh, means that there hasn't been a complete training programme around that care and welfare of uh, custody standard operating procedure. So staff make themselves as familiar as they can with that. I think that's reflected in the HMICS report. However, in our view, th there needs to be more training in that respect. Does anybody else wish to... Yes, Mr. Uh, Laidlaw. From my uh, experience as a custody visitor, the staff will usually let us know if we have a foreign national in. And there is a procedure, they ask them a series of questions if they want to see us, they'll break that procedure to try and make them understand. And if we get to see them again, rather than asking a, a list of questions, we'll go around it to make sure they're okay. Yes, okay, thank, thank you, that's very reassuring. Thank you. I, I take uh, Graham followed by Kevin, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr Laidlaw, if you, I think that you're the man that's at the, the coal face, if I can put it in that, that way. Could you give us some insight in, in, into your view of the quality of the training that visitors, uh, lay visitors receive before the visitations? And um, on a separate issue, your experience of how things have changed over the last uh, year or so, and what do you think the issues are going forward? 
Training is going on, I believe, just now. We're trying to get more volunteers within the scheme, so I can't comment on the training. So you <coughs> Not yet. under the new regime. Uh, the training we received under the old regime was more than adequate. And any issues we raise, any issues we raise now, are answered. So, what was your name? Uh, do you experience and what are the issues going forward? Numbers, numbers of uh, volunteers. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest issues. Uh, and a secondary issue is getting into the cell area. Uh, there can be delays. Because? They're busy, lack, lack of staff. It's not an excuse, uh, sure. but that's an excuse that is used all the time. Personally, we d I don't come across it where where we are based up in the north that very often. It does happen. You you can wait 30 minutes to get in, which is, 30 minutes is totally unacceptable. You don't expect instant access, uh, but you expect, usually you're in within about five minutes. Yeah. If there are no staff in police station you wait until somebody shows up they could be out in patrol okay and in terms of the visitation and there are issues that you'd raise whether major or minor do you record them in some kind of document and does that document eventually find its way to mr mcfadgen we have a sheet where we ask certain questions uh if we note a concern we'll speak to the person in custody and try to work it out there and then if we have any concerns, it's noted on an official in an official book, and it does make its way back to Brian. Whether or not it's resolved at the time, if it's resolved at the time, if it's not resolved, record it. Excuse me. If it, if it's a minor issue, and sometimes they are, uh, we try to resolve them there. Some people in custody will not accept that is the way. Nothing's gone wrong. That'll never be resolved. We've there's never been a major issue has come to your attention to, that to come and the, the visitors I, I work with there's never been a may something where i would stop and say you know we've got a serious problem here okay an example of a minor issue just just to advise us and also this is a I public session from that you've come across that you you resolved i haven't seen a doctor i haven't seen right. a lawyer and we let them know you know you you can ask to see a doctor We'll pass that on to staff. They'll bring, you know, the nurses there. It's noted. It's noted in the notes that they have seen a lawyer, or they have seen the doctor. It's just they might have forgotten. They might just be playing a little game. In light of the comments from Mr. Little, from your point of view, Mr. McFadden, about training, presumably it'll be your responsibility to recruit new visitors can you give us some insight into what's happening in, in that domain and what the way forward is from your perspective certainly um as you'll be aware the, the eight legacy schemes that operated previously were brought into the national scheme uh, um, to operate as one um, the numbers that existed previously were sufficient for the custody suites that were visited at that time um, but it was only about 60% of custody estate which was visited under the previous regime or regimes. So um, I had to widen the visiting areas for the existing visitors, which has now left gaps throughout the country. Um, I've been running national recruitment now for about 12, 14 weeks. Um, I've held two information days fairly recently, um, which has led to about 15 people, between 15 and 20 going forward to a training day, uh, which is being held on the 8th of November for potential new visitors. So hopefully it will start to fill the gaps that I have. Um, in respect of existing visitors, uh, there is a training day uh, being held on the 25th of this month. Um, there has been a slight gap because the um, focus was on uh, making sure that the, the national scheme was operating in the way it should. Um, so there has been some neglect on existing visitors because the focus, as I say, was on recruitment, training of new visitors to try and bring them on. 
Um, but we're now starting to address that, that things are starting to settle down and, and hopefully getting to where we should be. And, and that business plan that you'll have in the office about where you would like to be, you indicate you've got up to 20 people that you're putting through a course and you'll select from there if, if they're fit for purpose. How many would you like to recruit in order to fulfil your need and you have enough finance to pay them all uh, their, their expenses and whatever and their training if they all turn up? Um, I, I have currently at the moment 133 visitors who are um, actively visiting. Um, I have another five who are off rota for various personal reasons. Um, if I get uh, 15 out of the group that's going forward, I would probably look for another 10. The difficulty I have at the moment is it's, it's geographical and um, the north of the country, the islands, western islands, it's, it's fairly difficult to recruit locally. Um, so whilst I'm getting people showing an interest in it, it's, it's fairly localised, central belt, as, as you would expect. Um, the north of the country we're starting to see gaps and I'm going to have to try and, and, and put a bigger push in there. So running between 150, 160 would be a reasonable figure, my expectation. Uh, your second point, the, the finance, yes, I have been provided with adequate resources to, to finance the scheme. Yes. From Mr Diamond's viewpoint, largely it will be members of, of your organisation that will be in the custody suites, presumably. There is comment about delays accessing and, and staff shortage. Can you give us some notion? I know that custody suites have changed and there's been a <coughs> centralisation of custody suites. What's the impact in terms of trained staff being available and the management of those prisoners who are in custody? Absolutely. Uh, the, with the, uh, previously in the Strathclyde region, we went to a more centralised custody uh, uh, set-up. Uh, with on-demand cells, so basically there would be custody centres be supplemented by, by smaller centres uh, whenever demand uh, required that, and that's the model that Police Scotland seems to be moving towards just now. Uh, when the year was coming up here, I, I canvassed the custody officers that are members um, uh, to see what, uh, sorry, our custody officers who are members to get their opinion on the, the custody visiting scheme, and in the main it's very positive. Uh, the, but the one thing that they did pick up on was that the times of the visits at times put them under extra pressure. Um, because of literally because of staffing uh, levels where they wouldn't be able to assist the, the custody visit at that particular time and that could bring some sort of tensions around generally smoothed out uh, fairly quickly once they were actually in the custody center um, however custody at the moment is severely understaffed uh, it's been backfilled by police officers just now um, and they are undergoing a review i was at a meeting yesterday about that um, so we, they are undergoing a review and there is a whole um, a whole uh, new look at that from uh, from that perspective by Police Scotland, uh, but it's possibly something that we could liaise with the, the custody visitors, uh, 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 Brian here, um, to say, look, these are the, the, the these are the concerns that our members have around that, uh, and perhaps um, uh, you know. Whilst the restructure of custody division is going on, that we could have some sort of leeway around whenever the visitors are actually ar arriving at the place. One last question. It's for Mr. Kelly. Um, <coughs> the the recommendations indicate that although previously there had been a single occupancy a policy, which largely was attempted to be delivered, but you acknowledge within your report that you feel that moving forward, multi-occupancy might well be the case for the future. Did you consider what the impact of that might be for visitors coming in to sell passageways and seeking to speak to prisoners, will that whole process of, of that interview need to change if there's a multi-occupancy involved? I think the, the way that we've portrayed it is slightly different than that, and that is <coughs> that the goal of single occupancy, i.e. one custody, one cell, is certainly to be driven towards. That is the ideal to manage risk in the best way. However, the estate that's been inherited by Police Scotland uh, was, was some of its Victorian and was based on multi-cell occupancy. Large cells, six, seven, 10, 12 people in that. So in driving towards having a, a consistent single cell occupancy policy currently, <coughs> that means some cells have only got one person in it, whereas previously had many. So how has Police Scotland sought to manage that demand? Well, to do that, they have to move custodies around the country. And you'll see from our report that within a 10 month period, 
that was 2,300 custodies being moved around during their time under Police Scotland's care. So the point that we are making there is that having a hard and fast rule about single cell occupancy is actually generating or moving the risk from, <coughs> from where it was in the cell to transportation and there's other resource demands. So what we're encouraging is a bit more flexibility of thought around where it's appropriate, uh, where you could have three custodies rather than one in a large cell, then consider that because it could mean that two custodies do not have to be moved around the country. So that, that's where we are coming from in our inspection report. To answer your second question around how, how would multi-cell occupancy impact on the visitors, obviously the important thing is about people's safety, whether it's the custody, the detainee, the visitor, the police officers and police staff that are involved there. <coughs> so there would need to be a system of work that enabled uh, ICV visitors to come in, to be kept safe, but still to do their job, which was to seek access to the custodies and to find out privately as to how they felt they were being treated to ensure that there was no abuse. I mean, I think that, that that last comment is probably the key to any change that might occur, that presumably in many areas the interview takes place in the cell area, and that element of privately would mean that prisoners would need to be removed from the, the cell in order to have a private interview, and there'll be consideration about whether a visitor actually sees the cell environment to ensure that it's appropriate for detaining uh, prisoners in our custody. Okay, thanks very much. Please. Yeah, I want to say something, sorry. Yes, yes Mr. Just, McFay. Uh, follow up, Mr. Pearson. The, um, we have looked at how custody visiting would evolve should this occur, um, and I believe that there's a practice currently where um, I think the term is a toilet cell which is held in abeyance um, for the purposes of privacy and dignity. Um, and that would be made available to visitors. So if it is multiple occupancy um, and somebody chooses to accept a visit, the visitors would see the cell environment, but at the same time would be afforded the privacy to, 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 to carry out the visit. Thank you. Kevin, followed by Margaret. Uh, thank you, convener. My, my first question is really for Mr McFadden, who has uh, pointed out that there are some difficulties in recruitment in the north. Obviously, in the previous regimes, there was a great difficulty in establishing a scheme in Grampian in the first place. Can I maybe ask you what you're at now uh, in terms of coverage in, in the Grampian area, and in particular um, in rural Aberdeenshire and Murray? Yes. Um, when I assumed responsibility for the national scheme, which was on the 1st of October um, last year, uh, we had four visitors in Grampian. Um, I have run recruitment, as I mentioned. We now have eight uh, visitors. Um, two of them are located in the Elgin area and uh, tend to visit locally to that area. Uh, the remaining five um, are localised to, to Aberdeen City, um, do um, Fraserborough, and now Kitty Brewster, uh, since it, it opened previously, it was, uh, it was Queen Street, obviously. Um, and on looking at the analysis of throughput of custodies and detainees going through the more rural areas, uh, is the balance of how often places are visited. Um, so at the moment, uh, we are coping with the number that we have in that area, but again, I would probably seek to have another two to four visitors in there to, to make sure that there is a, a degree of resilience. And how do you go about advertising for um, visitors, Mr McFadden? The moment I have uh, running an advert on Volunteer Scotland website, I have a, an advert on Volunteer Aberdeen. Um, I have a contact there who is giving me access to local universities, student unions, uh, community radio, um, oil company uh, bulletins. Um, so we've got quite a wide scope um, and at the moment I'm looking at localised radio adverts uh, to see if I can boost it, as I say, because we have been running for 12 to 14 weeks. It's not been as uh, good a response as I would anticipated or hoped. 
Um, so I'm now looking at uh, local radio advertising to, to try and, as I say, and it is now becoming more localised uh, geographically to try and fill the gaps that I know I have. Is that local radio as in commercial local yes. radio, or is that um, some of the community radio stations which often have a, a greater outreach? Uh, we have a, a community radio reporter in here who's show uh, reaches uh, a massive audience, which I was quite surprised at. And often uh, these are the, the stations, I think, that you're probably more likely to get some attention paid to what's being said rather than an advert in between music. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking to do both. Um, previously, it was done on commercial radio, uh, but I've been made aware, as you say, that the, the reach of community radio sometimes is, is, is far better localised. Um, so, as I say, at the moment, I'm working um, to have... I didn't, didn't realise how much was involved in, in scripting and, and uh, voiceover and everything else is involved in radio ads, so I'm working on that at the moment uh, for, hopefully, into the new year, because I think um, in the run-up to Christmas, they're likely to get lost within um, all the retail adverts that, that are going out in the run-up to Christmas. Thank you. Can I, before we move on, can I ask if you're able to find a breakdown of independent custody visitor numbers per the, if you do it in the legacy, um, constabu legacy um, constabularies? Is it possible to do that? I mean, we've, you've discussed Grampian yeah. North East. It would be quite useful for the committee, and we all come from different parts, to see the breakdown across the rest of Scotland. Would that be possible? I don't have them to No, I know you don't, but yes. that, if you just send them to me as convener, it will also go on our um, website and the committee members can see it from different areas that they represent. Yes. Yes. It can also maybe help us in terms of uh, maybe helping you and trying to, yes. to recruit if we find folks who, who may be interested. If I could maybe turn to, to Mr Laidlaw, because he, he, you talked about uh, sometimes some delay in getting into the, the uh, custody area, Mr Laidlaw, for, for various reasons. Um, Mr Finney and I, uh, in a recent trip to Elgin, went into the custody area for a short period of time and it was suggested that we may not want to be in that area at that time because of a, a wee dirty protest that was going on. Um, and, uh, you know, we uh, decided to, that we would take the advice and not go in at that moment. Um, are there any specific things? Is there a pattern of reasons for, for you not being able to get it in? Or is it just that staffing reasons that, uh, uh, that you mentioned? It usually comes down to the 50-50 split. I would say we were busy and we were concerned for your safety. If there, It usually occurs when somebody's been booked in and so they're busy. Or if that person decides to cause trouble, they don't want us to, to bring us in. Uh, they're worried due to our safety. I, I, that's those are the two reasons I would say for, for delays. And can I ask you, sir? Do you visit various areas, or is it normally the same place that you're doing your visiting at? Inverness, Nairn, Aviemore, Dingwall, Allness. That was the legacy stations sure. uh -huh. that were covered. Now we're Wick, Thurso, Dornaway, Fort William. Fort William the Western Isles, the Orkneys. So, uh, forgive me, because I, I don't know these places particularly well in terms of the, um, the, the various establishments there. Are some of those modern custody uh, uh, holding areas and some of them old, or are they all, do they all tend to be old there? Inverness, Aviemore, Nairn, literally brand new. You couldn't fault them. Uh, Dingwall is a little old, older, same with all Ness, but they tend not to keep custodies in there. Wick and Thurso have been to, they've been there for years, but they're not run down. They're not Victorian by any stretch of the imagination. C can I ask you, is, is it, have you found that uh, there's no delays in some of the more modern facilities and you're getting in? and maybe the delays are in the older ones, or is, is that not the case? Va the vast majority of custodies held in the five stations I mentioned are taken through to Inverness, so that's where the delay is. If you go to Aviemore, uh, sometimes the station will be closed. When there's an officer in, it's usually you're in within a couple of minutes. The delay, is, and it's not a criticism, is nine times out of ten in Inverness. 
that's where everyone, uh, that's where all the custodies are taken to. For Mr. Cowie and, and Mr. Diamond, probably Mr. Diamond first in Before terms of... On, can I just yeah. ask Mr. Label, because I don't know how long you've been doing this. June 2000. And I why did you decide to do it? Why? Yes. Uh, I mean, there's a man looking for recruits. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to an independent custody visitor? I used to be a police officer, uh -huh. and I saw the ad... You might tell Mr. McFadden where you saw the ad. <laughs> Press and Journal, I think. It was. Oh, I didn't mention the P&G. Yes. And uh, it just it interested me. Uh -huh. Having had police experience, having worked in, in a cell area, it, I thought this, this sounds interesting. Uh -huh. And it has been. Yeah, well, there you are. You see, you could have plugged it for, and you know, committed to plug it to get more recruits in doing it if you find it interesting. Right, thank you. Thank Sorry you, about that. I was just curious. It's all right. Um, my question, probably for Mr. Diamond first, is um, around about modern uh, custody areas compared to, to older ones. Um, Kitty Brewster, which of course is, is in my constituency, is it easier to deal for, for staff to deal with? Um, the, the custodies and the visiting in these more modern facilities like Kitty Brewster than it was previously in the likes of Aberdeen Queen Street. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kitty Brewster obviously is a, a purpose-built facility and, and to be honest there's been some um, redundancy built into the building because we know there's going to be changes in, in Criminal Justice uh, Act for example. Um, so that has been taken into account whereas some of the older facilities, even the ones that have been modernised, don't have that. Uh, recently, the uh, Scottish Police Authority Finance Committee um, it put aside a fairly large amount of money, I think over £2 million, to accommodate some of the, 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 the changes that are required to some of the custody centres to bring them up to legislative scratch, if you like, if you like to call it that. So I think that, yeah, there are difficulties in there, um, but they are... Uh, there are possibly things for the future at the moment. But if we're dealing with what we're dealing with at the moment is purely down to staffing levels and considerations for the safety of the visitors when they come in that cause the delays. In, in terms of staffing levels, um, you know, is it? Do you think it's safer um, in modern facilities um, than it is in, in older facilities if there is not uh, at any one point the required amount of staff that's that's on the go? I think that, I think you're absolutely right because again because. It's, safety's been built into these new facilities yes. where the other ones could be uh, adapted from whatever building has been there. Um, I'll give you an example of one of my local areas, is, which is Coat Bridge. Now, Coat Bridge had, I think it was 10 cells before. It's now a custody holding centre. Uh, there are 20 cells and they've got modular cells. What's happened is the old cells, which were cold, wet, damp, you name it, have been uh, upgraded in line with the new modular cells which have come in, which have been specifically built for that purpose. And they are much, they are, they are much safer. And again, it comes down to the sales of multiple occupancy or, or single occupancy, a completely different ballgame whenever you're dealing with prisoners uh, and much easier to deal with. Similarly with charge bars, uh, where the prisoners are initially brought, um, the, the older ones are, are um, much less amenable, let's say, than the, 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 the more modern designed ones. Thank you, Mr Stewart. The, there's no doubt that Police Scotland inherited a very disparate landscape of facilities, some of them which, as I said, were Victorian and have evolved rather than been designed to the new enlightened standards that have come out over the la last 20 years or so. So there's no doubt that a purpose-built custody block now bears very little resemblance to something built 100 years ago. The, the issue then is for Police Scotland and others is that the custody estate needs significant investment to maintain or improve the standard of health and safety both for the custodies and for the people that are working within them. And you'll see that actually recommendation 14 of our report uh, says as a matter of urgency that Police Scotland should finalise the custody estate strategy. Where are they taking it? Uh, and work in partnership with the Police Authority and Scottish Government to prioritise investment in the custody estate because of that very disparate standard uh, across Scotland. Argument, Mr. Cowie, that um, spending capital sums on on these kind of things, which are probably often not very popular with some members of the public, um, it would actually lead to savings in revenue budgets in the future. There's absolutely no doubt that the business case would have to be made around that. But the, I think one of the non-negotiables is the, the standard of health and safety to keep people in custody. Uh, very few, if any, of the 200,000 people kept in custody want to be in custody. 
uh, it's around these facilities are required, they need to be modern and enable staff and the custodies to be kept safely. So that investment needs to be prioritised against many other competing demands, not only within the police service but across the, the public sector. But uh, we are encouraging Police Scotland to come up with that estate strategy to see where the investment is needed, how much is required, and obviously they'll have to negotiate that amongst many other demands with government. Thank you. That's very useful, gentlemen. Thank you, convener. I was just wondering if any ECHR implications, um, you know, if facilities were not suitable for people in custody. What we're saying is that they need to, to maintain or improve them, there needs to be a significant investment. What we saw in our visits, we visited 22 of the custody stations unannounced. We spoke to 94 custodies during our inspection and we examined over 100 custody records to look at, look at these things. What we, what we found from that is that, yes, there needs to be improvements uh, throughout there. Things like stairs in custody areas, which are not ideal, we know that 68% of custodies have either mental health, alcohol or drug issues and therefore you do not want to be moving around with uh, somebody who is inebriated or intoxicated uh, or under the influence rather up and down stairs uh, when you are when you're dealing with that. That is nobody's interest around that. So clearly there needs to be prioritised investment around that. We are not saying it is an easy thing to solve but there are, are implications that if that investment is not made, then obviously a state, like anybody's house, goes downhill if there's not that money spent on it year after year. But I believe there would be revenue savings. Mr Laidlaw, I thought so. You wanted to come in there. Just indicate somebody if you want to come in. Yes, Mr Laidlaw. At the end of the day, everybody that's taken into police custody has just been arrested. That's all they are. They're, they're not guilty. And any of us could be arrested. And you were saying about uh, human rights. Yes. None of us would want to be put into the Victorian cells we're hearing about. So if the investment has to be made, very difficult to justify it to the hard, you know, the, the, the taxpayer. But that I think, from what I've seen of custodies, you know, that message has to be put across that this investment has to be put in to bring standards up to a, a decent level. Bearing in mind, as we all do, I think the, the, the pressures on all budgets, and it is, uh, but balancing it against what the public may perceive or think, and the rights of people, quite rightly, as you say, that have been arrested, not even been necessarily um, through the court, not being through the court process in any way. Yeah, that just crossed my mind that Margaret, Alison, and John again. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. If I could direct my first question, perhaps, Mr. Cowie, you mentioned that. Um, a lot of the, the detainees have mental health problems and in your report um, is highlighted that the referral scheme for access to mental health is, is very limited. Could you tell us really what's being done to try and um, address that? You, you can see from our report that we've certainly suggested for improvement that uh, training and awareness of staff around mental health issues uh, is one, one issue and the other one is about access to the services that we know are out there. There's a real, a real goal to be had there, or a prize, is that many people of the 200,000 that come through custodies live chaotic lifestyles and might not necessarily engage with their GP or other people. You have them as a captive audience, if I can use that term, uh, and therefore there's an opportunity to join up work to access these services for individuals who may be amenable uh, to, to doing that at that time, whereas they won't be when they're out and about in the community and perhaps uh, living in that kind of chaotic lifestyle. So I think there's an opportunity there that we're encouraging Police Scotland to take. That's work in partnership. It's not within the gift of Police Scotland themselves. And I know from, uh, from briefing from Police Scotland, and we're receiving an update by the end of this year as to the progress against the recommendations, but I know that they are engaging with partners to see how this could be moved forward. So I'm not going to be an overnight solution. To some areas of the country, I see generally you're talking about the the lack of consistency and just the the kind of thing a detainee could expect, you know, in, in one area of the country compared to another. Yeah, I think that's a general comment that could be made about the custody uh, arrangements. In that, uh, we welcome the fact that there has been greater consolidation 
off access to these services, but you still can't get around the geography of Scotland and the difficulties of offering services across a massive uh, part of Western Europe. So those, those challenges do exist, absolutely. Um, if I could perhaps ask Mr McFadden, you, you talked about the training of new volunteers and existing volunteers, um, a one-day training, and I think the SPA website says that that would consist of practical and, three, and three, uh, a theoretical exercise. Could you elaborate on, on exactly you know, what, what kind of training it is and also comment if you think it's sufficient for the volunteers to feel confident interacting with um, detainees who may have mental illness and who um, uh, have abuse issues as well, whether that's alcohol or drugs? Certainly. Um, the training day um, for new uh, volunteers, the initial information day uh, provides a background and information on the scheme to allow people to judge whether it's something they wish to, to participate in. The training day, we move on, and it's more in-depth training around the legislation which governs the scheme, um, any other legislation that may be relevant to them um, in their role. Um, there is a, a large input from Police Scotland uh, who come in and, and explain the training they receive, the procedures that they use, um, and then we move on, um, and it's scenario-based exercises within a custody environment, which is custom-built at uh, the Jackton Training Centre. Um, outside East Kilbride, which um, allows the scenarios to be run whilst being uh, beamed back to the classroom to allow everybody uh, to see it. And thereafter, it's, it's uh, a group discussion on, on how uh, the issues were dealt with. The, um, the detainee, the, the officer that's doing the role playing, is primed with various um, responses uh, dependent on how the visitors um, react with them. Um, and as I say, everybody can see what happens when we return to the classroom. And it's just a group discussion as to points raised, how people uh, felt it was dealt with, how they would have dealt with it differently. Um, and, and then just some guidance um, from myself and uh, Police Scotland uh, Training Department as to uh, what we think would have been the best way to deal with the situations as they arose. Um, and then after that, it's basically the, the, the finer detail of the scheme, um, how they would carry out the visit, the reporting mechanism, how that operates. Um, and it's really just to ensure they're comfortable with um, the knowledge that they have before they start the, the visit. Um, we then do a familiarisation visit to a, a local custody centre to let everybody see a real live environment. Um, and then they will be partnered with an experienced visitor for six or eight months uh, until they're comfortable again. Um, and, and we see that they're performing as we would, we would have anticipated they would after the training. So I'm also looking at a, a more structured mentoring scheme um, where to ensure that the individuals that are bringing on new visitors are doing the, what they should correctly. Um, that um, not having a go at Paul in any way, but when you've been doing it for 14 years and the training is intermittent, um, you know, that there are there are habits that may be picked up. So I am just want to ensure, because I've, I've heard uh, fairly recently there's a couple of discrepancies around the country from previous training environments. So I'm just looking for standardisation to ensure that everything goes forward uh, properly. Okay. Mr. Leto, do you have any comments on that? Well, you've obviously got vast experience of custody visiting. Is there anything you would incorporate into the training or any comments you would have on it? Uh, listening to that, it all sounds very good. Uh, it, it, it's going into a very strange environment. Uh, mind you, if you're a volunteer, you, you, you're not just walking in off the street. And the more training, training is very good, but it's... The actual going into the cells, that's, that's where you learn and take from your training. But I'm very heartened by what I'm hearing. And yes, after 14 years, you do uh, follow certain practices, possibly, that you shouldn't be. And Is this a, this is 
a confession that we're about to have, Mr. Laidlaw. Uh, you might get mentored if you watch it. You get very used to dealing with certain officers, and you do get you do get to able to read people, and you ask certain questions. They may give you the wrong answer, but you know that certain things have happened. You know they have been advised of their rights. You know when you ask them, do you know why you're here? Some people will say no. They're stone cold sober. Of course they know what. But you know within your own mind that they know. Yes. I think even politicians Absolutely. evolve with experience, I think. I think it was very helpful, uh, Mr McFadden, especially when you talked about them being partnered, because I was beginning to wonder if you just did your training and then you just were sent forth, you know, um, uh, which is, I think, excellent to hear that. Margaret, do you want to? Yeah, there was just one uh, further question for Mr Diamond. Um, in Unison's uh, submission to the consultation on the reforming police and fire rescue services, you were very much in favour of um, ICV being put on a statutory basis, but you also recommended a role for local authorities to review and report on custody visiting as appropriate, and also that there should be a place to cover court cells. Have either of these two things been followed through or acted on? Not that I'm aware of. Not that we're aware of. Um, there's obviously a reason we want to keep the locality and things, which is why we, we spoke about local authorities. Um, but, uh, but as for courts, that's outside our, our uh, area of, of experience, so I couldn't really comment on that. It's one of the recommendations, mm. I think. So, anyway. Right, Margaret. <laughs> uh, Alison, then John again, please. Thank you. Um, the report, Mr Cowie, um, makes reference to uh, community initiatives um, to secure the well-being of, in of individuals under the influence of drugs and alcohol, things like street pastors and safety buses, and it also specifically references Albine House in Aberdeen. Um, can you tell the committee a little bit more about what the benefit of these sort of services are um, via v, um, using custody cells? The, the, uh, as I said, it's a high-risk environment dealing with custodies for, for all concerned. Uh, and we see a number of initiatives which are aimed at basically giving the best care for the individual in the state that they are at that time. Our clear view is that if somebody is drunk, a police cell is not the best place for them. If they've not committed any uh, tangible offence other than being inebriated, then they can, they can get better care elsewhere. And some of the schemes that have sought to address that are similar to Albine Housing uh, or Albine House, which looks at trained individuals looking after somebody while they sober up. Uh, in our view, that would be an ideal world. That would be much better. We see that paralleled in Inverness in our report, where the ambulance service will assess almost as a triage basis on the street with police colleagues if they're called to somebody found slumped in the street through alcohol. And the, the paramedics will say, yes, bet, better take them to hospital to uh, treat them rather than take them to a police cell. Because if you think about the inefficiencies there, not only the, the way of dealing with them, but you have an individual that's inebriated that has to then go through the checking in procedure with all the delays that's there. Then a, a nurse or a doctor may have to be called out to assess them. And ultimately, they end up going to hospital anyway. Therefore, it would seem to be more efficient for the whole system to have a, an alternative around that. Street pastors was probably earlier uh, upstream, as it were, where the, the whole point is people should be allowed to enjoy themselves. Even in Scotland, we should be able to, to do that. Uh, and therefore, people go out and street pastors can have a word with folk, perhaps if they're straying over the line or getting close to that line where their behaviour is impacting on others adversely. Uh, and they can have a word with them. They can hand out flip-flops to uh, young ladies whose feet are hurting because of the, the spikes they're wearing. All these sorts of things that can help people not end up in police custody or making themselves vulnerable and either becoming a victim or a custody, neither of which we want in the police service. I'm not speaking for Police Scotland, but generally as the, as the police service. So uh, there's some really positive things that I think can add value. Many of these projects have been developed in partnership with um, health services, local authorities and the police themselves. And uh, Albine House in particular was, was funded in that way as a, a three-partner process. It's now at risk 
um, of, of closure because of the police service withdrawing its funding from that, or at least threatening to withdraw its funding from that. I, does that seem to you a short-sighted way to go about it? As I say, I can't speak for Police Scotland. What, what we'd encourage is that the business model for dealing with custodies on those issues has to be sustainable moving forward. And I think one of the, the positive benefits that we've seen from having one custody division across Scotland is that an engagement with partnerships is an awful lot easier from the partnership perspective. That's the feedback we've got from agencies yeah. that say we now have one point of contact to establish process, procedure, see the knock-on effect of one agency doing something differently, etc. So there's some real benefits around having that in one division. The challenges of partnership working and who pays for what, who's the net donor, again, our report unfortunately does not wave a magic wand across that, but I know is something that actively Police Scotland are engaged in discussing the way forward around the best way to deal with people that come into custody. That's helpful. If I could turn to um, chapter, no, not chapter, sorry, paragraph 82, you talk about children and young people in the report. And of course, um, it should be only under exceptional circumstances that children are, are held in custody. You've said that um, there's been a 25% reduction in the number of young people held. Could you just quantify that really, please, for us? I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. I'm afraid I can't do that off the top of my okay. head, but um, I'll endeavour to get those figures to you uh, from Police Scotland. That would be useful. Um, and could you um, outline the procedures that are in place to ensure that um, vulnerabilities in young people are identified from the outset? The, the, the issue, and this wouldn't be peculiar to young people, but it would be to everybody that came through the door in a custody facility, is that that first part of what's called colloquially as booking in or checking in the, the custody, uh, when they are initially presented to the, the custody facility, an assessment is done of themselves, the evidence, is it justifiable that they are detained or arrested? And if so, OK, we've got this individual, what are their needs? And a lot, large part of that is requesting them to disclose medical uh, conditions or have they taken anything. So there's a long and detailed checklist of that. We also would, our Police Scotland would expect the staff to be picking up any cues from that that may indicate somebody may need an appropriate adult, for instance, to aid that communication process, or if there's particular syndromes that would uh, be reflected in their behaviour. So there's an, an amount of guidance within standard operating procedures married up with training and also with experience to try and assess uh, what people's needs are. So the vulnerability aspects of that may require a nurse who's present or a doctor to be called out to assess the individual. Uh, but quite often the staff will use their own initiative and say, the vibe I'm getting off this custody is that they need either an appropriate adult or we need to get medical attention uh, or assessment to them. When it comes to vulnerability as to uh, ongoing abuse in their lives, I don't know if that's what also what you're referring to, then obviously that again is much similar is what we found in our inspection that both the PCSOs, the police staff and police officers are very good at developing a rapport with the custody and quite often they might come in fighting and screaming, that's the custody uh, and <laughs> And by the time they leave custody, <laughs> by the time they leave custody, they're actually thanking the officers and staff for the way that they've been looked after. So it's about building that rapport, sometimes with the repeat customers, that they can pick up these things. And sometimes they will, the custodians will confide in a member of police staff, particularly as they're not a police officer, or with an officer, to say that something else is going on in my life and I want to make an allegation of abuse or whatever. So we're relying on our, our highly skilled and dedicated staff. And the other thing I'd like to get across there is that we found that staff were very professional and really wanted to give a caring service, which might be contrary to the public perception of custody and grumpy jailers. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually found uh, a much more enlightened approach to that and real dedication. Could, could I just ask? Just what you've sent them, because you've got recommendation six, which would seem rather alarmist police Scotland should review its approach to the use of force in custody um, you know against what you're telling us they develop especially the people you call rather sweetly repeat customers um, to put that into perspective what that means in your recommendation you know because obviously what you've said is that 
custody officers and they get used to dealing with things and know how to deflect and bring the heighten the tension, bring it down rather than up it. Is actually the recording of the use of force. Right. The use of force is on a continuum from perhaps just holding their arm and guiding them from charge bar to cell or to applying handcuffs to actually having to have three officers restrain somebody who's biting, fighting and spitting. So it's on a, on a continuum there. What we would like to see is more consistency about recording of that. You weren't concerned about the, no. the incidents, I'm taking no. it? No. Right. And the reason why we're important, if, okay. if you bear with me, the, the reason why we think that's important is the UK signed up in 2003 to the U UN uh, OPCAT, it's called, the optional uh, protocol against, uh, or for the Convention Against Torture. And there needs to be an audit trail to show that people are not being uh, abused and tortured within custody. And ICV, with their 720 visits every six months, and HMI every couple of years going round there, that's a really important part of, of convincing and showing that members of our community, when they're locked up in Scotland, are being well looked after. Uh, Thank you. Stop. Thank you for that. Just expanding on it. And you do you on a different point? And as following up the child, um, but uh, it's a different point. You can in take over, to Alison. So you want to allow him in? Yes, that's okay. That's all right with Alison. It's all right with me. Thank you, Kavina. <laughs> um, Mr. Kelly, it's, it's on that particular point. Mr. Stewart and I um, met with uh, officers, and it was about the different arrangements applied in the, the previous forces. And the example given to us was um, officers had engaged with someone who was to be taken into custody. It had all been very amicably um, transacted. Um, 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 there had been no hands-on, a totally compliant individual, but because of revised guidelines, they then were told that they would have to restrain the individual at the charge bar. And what they were saying was this fundamentally thereafter changed the relationship. What had been a very consensual engagement, compliant had changed. Is that in any way what you're alluding to at all? Yeah, um, we, we in discussed with Police Scotland that very thing. It's about that risk aversion approach to custodies, is that discretion has to be used and force can be applied on that continuum and therefore common sense to a certain extent has to be built into the standard procedures. So what we're encouraging Police Scotland to do is don't, don't necessarily have one size fits all, but have the principle that people should be kept safe. So therefore we would certainly encourage them to be uh, discretionary around that. That's very reassuring. Thank, Thank you, you. Alison. Yeah. Uh, just returning to the custody of young people, I'd be interested to hear from the independent custody visitor side of things if you specifically always ask if there are children in custody and if there are, if there are particular um, processes that you would want to check on. The process we work to now, we, because we have to fill in a f an official form, we ask male, female, and if there are any children. The old legacy, the, you, you didn't ask, but I always did. Uh, we cannot force a person to see us, but I would, if there was a child, and it's only been a handful of occasions, but if there was a child in custody, I would always almost encourage the officer to, to forget the, the preamble and ask the child, you know, almost demand that they see us. Uh, and you, again, you do not go through the same question and answer because they're children. Uh, so I'm, that's one thing that I'll, if I come across a new officer in a police station, I'll inevitably ask them, will, will you allow me if you had a child? You know, would you allow me to see a child if it was in custody? And some of them still wonder what they would say, and then I, I tell them that we're allowed to see children. So children are high on the agenda, very, very high. That's really sure. Thank you. John, and this, we'll have to move on quickly after this. Indeed, they're, right. they're, they're very brief. It's just a question to Mr Laidlow. Mr Laidlow, are you allowed access to NHS staff working 
in the custody areas. Are you able to speak with them? Yes, we, you speak to them. Uh, they walk by, they know our face, we know their face. Yes, we can speak to them. That, that's lovely, thanks. A, a very quick one to, to Mr Cowie. Uh, firstly, thanks for recommendation nine about the access, solicitor access recording form and more to particularly the letter of rights. I think that's, it's good that that's, that's highlighted and I, I hope it will be picked up on. Just are more people detained now than used to be? Mr Cowie, that's certainly my perception of things. It's a very difficult question to answer because you know the challenges of Police Scotland's ICT systems uh, and benchmarking against that. What uh, it's, uh, we, We're clear in this report here that there's records of 192,000 custodies going through Police Scotland's hands uh, in the period that we're talking about. That seems to be broadly similar with previous, but we can't say that statistically because the challenges of marrying it up uh, around uh, ICT systems. Are you able to say, are, are more people detained to appear in court rather than released for citation? I, I couldn't, and I, I don't think Police Scotland could give you those figures, and certainly if we could fire the question to Police Scotland, uh, they would certainly be able to provide you with the data that they, or the people they currently uh, call, very much more difficult to give you that historical comparison. Okay, thank you. And the, the very final one... And it, would it possibly be connected to the, the different nature over the decades of the state of some of the people who are brought into custody because of various substance abuse that they might be in custody and otherwise they might not have been in custody just because of their, their physical state, either mental well-being or the fact that they are drunk or they're on drugs or whatever? It, was that any, do you think that maybe you can't answer that? It's anecdotal. I just wondered if that may have something to do with figures... Anecdotally, that will have had an impact on uh, how many people have been arrested. Uh, we also see declines in some, some drug use, uh, different patterns in alcohol use. People are drinking more at home because it's too expensive in the pub, so it's more about private space offences rather than public space necessarily. Uh, there's also changes in policy around who should be kept in court, uh, kept in custody before appearing in court. So there's all a huge number of variables there which I couldn't answer off the top of the head. So maybe if we got the figures, we'd also need to have a look at all the other stuff that, that led to the figures as well, to give a clear picture. I think the causal relationship is very difficult to prove. Uh -huh, right, OK. Sorry, John. The very final one is, and, and, um, is the question of legalised cells. Now, I know there was a change to reduce the number recently. Excusing my ignorance, and I, and I don't recall if it's mentioned in the report, is that touched upon because you could literally have the same cell discharging a different function. And, and would, would the scheme apply if it was being used as a legalised cell as distinct from a police custody cell? The, I, I can perhaps answer around yeah. what I believe the police uh, position is. A legalised cell uh, would be subject to inspection by Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, uh, having, having been previously an area commander and, and gone through that, thankfully, very well. However, uh, as to the ICV aspect of that, I'd have to defer to Brian's knowledge around, around that. I suspect it would be out with scope. Um, if I may, um, the report last year which recommended the reduction uh, in the number of legalised cells and also the transfer of responsibility for legalised cells from uh, prison visiting committees across to custody visiting. Um, my understanding of the time scale is that is likely to be into next year. Um, they have reduced, I believe, the number from 12 to 5, um, as it stands just now. I think it's Kirkwall, Lerwick, Boyk and Stonomy. Um, so th they are uh, still under the, 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 the remit of the prison visiting committees, as it stands at the moment. Um, but my understanding, it, the responsibility will come across to custody visiting within the next six to eight months. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank uh, you. I, that's fine. That, that concludes our question. Thank you very much uh, for attending and thank you for reports and the evidence that you provided. I'm going to move, if you'll forgive me as you leave, I'm still going to move straight on given the time of the clock and go on to item two. Just as a quick one for you all here, decision on taking business in private, our next final item day is to consider our work programme in private at the next meeting. As members know, it's standard practice to consider these items in private, but we'll publish any decisions on future work on the website as soon as it's agreed. Are we agreed that we'll consider our work programme in private at our next meeting on 13th of November? Agreed. Thank you very much. I formally close the meeting.